The history of logic is the study of the development of the science of valid inference. Formal logic was developed in ancient times in China, India, and Greece. Greek logic, particularly Aristotelian logic, found wide application and acceptance in science and mathematics. Aristotle's logic was further developed by Islamic and Christian philosophers in the Middle Ages, reaching a high point in the mid-14th century. The period between the 14th century and the beginning of the 19th century was largely one of decline and neglect, and is regarded as barren by at least one historian of logic. Logic was revived in the mid-19th century, at the beginning of a revolutionary period when the subject developed into a rigorous and formalistic discipline whose exemplar was the exact method, if proof used in mathematics. The development of the modern, symbolic, or mathematical logic during this period is the most significant in the 2000-year history of logic, and is arguably one of the most important and remarkable events in human intellectual history. Progress in mathematical logic in the first few decades of the 20th century, particularly arising from the work of Gödel and Tarski had a significant impact on analytic philosophy and philosophical logic, particularly from the 1950s onwards, in subjects such as modal logic, temporal logic, deontic logic, and relevance logic. Prehistory of logic. Valid reasoning has been employed in all periods of human history. However, logic studies the principles of valid reasoning, inference and demonstration. It is probable that the idea of demonstrating a conclusion first arose in connection with geometry, which originally meant the same as land measurement. The ancient Egyptians discovered geometry, including the formula for the volume of a truncated pyramid. Another origin can be seen in Babylonia. Esagil Canapli's medical diagnostic handbook in the 11th century BC was based on a logical set of axioms and assumptions, while Babylonian astronomers in the 8th and 7th centuries BC employed an internal logic within their predictive planetary systems an important contribution to the philosophy of science. Logic in Greek philosophy Before Plato while the ancient Egyptians empirically discovered some truths of geometry, the great achievement of the ancient Greeks was to replace empirical methods by demonstrative science. The systematic study of this seems to have begun with the school of Pythagoras in the late 6th century BC. The three basic principles of geometry are as follows. Certain propositions must be accepted as true without demonstration. Such a proposition is known as an axiom of geometry. Every proposition that is not an axiom of geometry must be demonstrated as following from the axioms of geometry. Such a demonstration is known as a proof or a derivation of the proposition. The proof must be formal, that is, the derivation of the proposition must be independent of the particular subject matter in question. Fragments of early proofs are preserved in the works of Plato and Aristotle, and the idea of a deductive system was probably known in the Pythagorean school and the Platonic Academy. Separately from geometry, the idea of a standard argument pattern is found in the method of proof known as reductio ad absurdum which was used by Zeno of Ella, a pre-Socratic philosopher of the 5th century BC. This is the technique of drawing an obviously false conclusion from an assumption, thus demonstrating that the assumption is false. Plato's Parmenides portrays Zeno as claiming to have written a book defending the monism of Parmenides by demonstrating the absurd consequence of assuming that there is plurality. Other philosophers who practiced such dialectic reasoning were the minor Socratics, including Euclid of Megara, who were probably followers of Parmenides and Zeno. The members of this school were called dialecticians. Further evidence that pre-Aristotelian thinkers were concerned with the principles of reasoning is found in the fragment called Disoi Logoi, probably written at the beginning of the 4th century BC. This is part of a protracted debate about truth and falsity. In the case of the classical Greek city-states, interest in argumentation was also stimulated by the activities of the rhetoricians or orators and the sophists. 
who used arguments to defend or attack a thesis both in legal and political contexts. Plato's logic None of the surviving works of the great 4th century philosopher Plato include any formal logic, but they include important contributions to the field of philosophical logic. Plato raises three questions. What is it that can properly be called true or false? What is the nature of the connection between the assumptions of a valid argument and its conclusion? What is the nature of definition? The first question arises in the dialogue Theaetetus, where Plato identifies thought or opinion with talk or discourse. The second question is a result of Plato's theory of forms. Forms are not things in the ordinary sense, nor strictly ideas in the mind, but they correspond to what philosophers later called universals, namely an abstract entity common to each set of things that have the same name. In both the Republic and the Sophist, Plato suggests that the necessary connection between the assumptions of a valid argument and its conclusion corresponds to a necessary connection between forms. The third question is about definition. Many of Plato's dialogues concern the search for a definition of some important concept, and it is likely that Plato was impressed by the importance of definition in mathematics. What underlies every definition is a platonic form, the common nature present in different particular things. Thus, a definition reflects the ultimate object of understanding, and is the foundation of all valid inference. This had a great influence on Aristotle, in particular Aristotle's notion of the essence of a thing, Aristotle's logic The logic of Aristotle, and particularly his theory of the syllogism, has had an enormous influence in Western thought. His logical works, called the Organon, are the earliest formal study of logic that have come down to modern times. Though it is difficult to determine the dates, the probable order of writing of Aristotle's logical works is the categories, a study of the ten kinds of primitive term, the topics, a discussion of dialectics, on interpretation, an analysis of simple categorical propositions into simple terms, negation, and signs of quantity. It also contains a comprehensive treatment of the notions of opposition and conversion. Chapter 7 is at the origin of the square of opposition. Chapter 9 contains the beginning of modal logic. The prior analytics, a formal analysis of what makes a syllogism. The posterior analytics, a study of scientific demonstration, containing Aristotle's mature views on logic. These works are of outstanding importance in the history of logic. Aristotle was the first logician to attempt a systematic analysis of logical syntax, of noun, and of verb. In the categories, he attempts to discern all the possible things to which a term can refer. The idea underpins his philosophical work Metaphysics, which itself had a profound influence on Western thought. He was the first to deal with the principles of contradiction and excluded middle in a systematic way. He was the first formal logician, in that he demonstrated the principles of reasoning by employing variables to show the underlying logical form of an argument. He was looking for relations of dependence which characterize necessary inference and distinguish the validity of these relations from the truth of the premises. The prior analytics contains his exposition of the syllogism, where three important principles are applied for the first time in history. The use of variables, a purely formal treatment, and the use of an axiomatic system. He also developed a theory of non-formal logic, which is presented in topics and sophistical refutations. Stoic logic The other great school of Greek logic is that of the Stoics. Stoic logic traces its roots back to the late 5th century BC philosopher Euclid of Megara, a pupil of Socrates and slightly older contemporary of Plato. His pupils and successors were called Megarians, or Aristics, and later the Dialecticians. The two most important dialecticians of the Megarian school were Diodorus Cronus and Philo, who were active in the late 4th century BC. The Stoics adopted the Megarian logic and systemized it. 
The most important member of the school was Chrysippus, who was its third head, and who formalized much of Stoic doctrine. He is supposed to have written over 700 works, including at least 300 on logic, almost none of which survive. Unlike with Aristotle, we have no complete works by the Megarians or the early Stoics, and have to rely mostly on accounts by later sources including prominently Diogenes Laertius, Sextus Empiricus, Galen, Aulus Gellius, Alexander of Aphrodisias, and Cicero. Three significant contributions of the Stoic school were their account of modality, their theory of the material conditional, and their account of meaning and truth. Modality According to Aristotle, the Megarians of his day claimed there was no distinction between potentiality and actuality. Diodorus Cronus defined the possible as that which either is or will be, the impossible as what will not be true, and the contingent as that which either is already, or will be false. Diodorus is also famous for what is known as his master argument, which states that each pair of the following three propositions contradicts the third proposition. Everything that is past is true and necessary. The impossible does not follow from the possible. What neither is nor will be is possible. Diodorus used the plausibility of the first two to prove that nothing is possible if it neither is nor will be true. Chrysippus, by contrast, denied the second premise and said that the impossible could follow from the possible. Conditional Statements The first logicians to debate conditional statements were Diodorus and his pupil Philo of Megara. Sextus Empiricus refers three times to a debate between Diodorus and Philo. Philo regarded a conditional as true unless it has both a true antecedent and a false consequent. Precisely, let T0 and T1 be true statements, and let F0 and F1 be false statements. Then, according to Philo, each of the following conditionals is a true statement, because it is not the case that the consequent is false while the antecedent is true. If T0, then T1. If F0, then T0. If F0, then F1. The following conditional does not meet this requirement, and is therefore a false statement according to Philo. If T0, then F0. Indeed, Sextus says, according to Philo, there are three ways in which a conditional may be true, and one in which it may be false. Philo's criterion of truth is what would now be called the truth functional definition of if. Then, it is the definition used in modern logic. In contrast, Diodorus allowed the validity of conditionals only when the antecedent clause could never lead to an untrue conclusion. A century later, the Stoic philosopher Chrysippus attacked the assumptions of both Philo and Diodorus, meaning and truth. The most important and striking difference between Megarian Stoic logic and Aristotelian logic is that Megarian Stoic logic concerns propositions, not terms, and is thus closer to modern propositional logic. The Stoics distinguished between utterance, which may be noise, speech, which is articulate but which may be meaningless, and discourse, which is meaningful utterance. The most original part of their theory is the idea that what is expressed by a sentence, called electon, is something real. This corresponds to what is now called a proposition. Sextus says that according to the Stoics, three things are linked together, that which signifies, that which is signified, and the object, for example, that which signifies is the word dion, and that which is signified is what Greeks understand but barbarians do not, and the object is dion himself. Logic in Asia Logic in India Logic began independently in ancient India and continued to develop to early modern times without any known influence from Greek. Logic Medhatadi Gautama founded the Anviksiki school of logic. The Mahabharata, around the 5th century BC, refers to the Anviksiki and Taka schools of logic. Panini developed a form of logic for his formulation of Sanskrit grammar. Logic is described by Chanakya in his Arthashastra as an independent field of inquiry. Two of the six Indian schools of thought deal with logic, Nyaya and Vaisheshika. 
The Nyaya Sutras of Aksapada Gautama constitute the core texts of the Nyaya school, one of the six orthodox schools of Hindu philosophy. This realist school developed a rigid five-member schema of inference involving an initial premise, a reason, an example, an application, and a conclusion. The idealist Buddhist philosophy became the chief opponent to the Nyayikas. Nagarjuna, the founder of the Madhyamika, developed an analysis known as the Katuskoti, a four-cornered system of argumentation that involves the systematic examination and rejection of each of the four possibilities of a proposition, P, that is, being, not P, that is, not being, P and not P, that is, being and not being, not, that is, neither being nor not being. It is interesting to note that under propositional logic, De Morgan's laws imply that this is equivalent to the third case, and is therefore superfluous. There are actually only three cases to consider. However, Dignagar is sometimes said to have developed a formal syllogism, and it was through him and his successor, Dharmakirti. That Buddhist logic reached its height, it is contested whether their analysis actually constitutes a formal syllogistic system. In particular, their analysis centered on the definition of an inference warranting relation, by apta, also known as invariable concomitance or pervasion. To this end, a doctrine known as a POA, or differentiation was developed. This involved what might be called inclusion and exclusion of defining properties. The difficulties involved in this enterprise, in part, stimulated the neo-scholastic school of Navya Nyaya, which developed a formal analysis of inference in the 16th century. This later school began around eastern India and Bengal, and developed theories resembling modern logic, such as Gottlob Frege's distinction between sense and reference of proper names, and his definition of number, as well as the Navya Nyaya theory of restrictive conditions for universals, anticipating some of the developments in modern set theory. Since 1824, Indian logic attracted the attention of many Western scholars, and has had an influence on important 19th-century logicians such as Charles Babbage, Augustus de Morgan, and particularly George Boole, as confirmed by his wife Mary Everest Boole, who wrote in 1901 an open letter to Dr. Bose which was titled Indian Thought in Western Science in the 19th Century, and stated, Think what must have been the effect of the intense Hinduizing of three such men as Babbage, de Morgan and George Ball on the mathematical atmosphere of 1830 to 1865. Dignagar's famous Wheel of Reason is a method of indicating when one thing can be taken as an invariable sign of another thing but the inference is often inductive and based on past observation. Matalal remarks that Dignagar's analysis is much like John Stuart Mill's joint method of agreement and difference, which is inductive. In addition, the traditional five-member Indian syllogism, though deductively valid, has repetitions that are unnecessary to its logical validity. As a result, some commentators see the traditional Indian syllogism as a rhetorical form that is entirely natural in many cultures of the world and yet not as a logical form, not in the sense that all logically unnecessary elements have been omitted for the sake of analysis. Logic in China In China, a contemporary of Confucius, Motsi, Master Mo, is credited with founding the Mohist school, whose canons dealt with issues relating to valid inference and the conditions of correct conclusions. In particular, one of the schools that grew out of Mohism, the logicians, accredited by some scholars for their early investigation of formal logic. Due to the harsh rule of legalism in the subsequent Qin dynasty, this line of investigation disappeared in China until the introduction of Indian philosophy by Buddhists.